Great, I think it's been recording, so. Okay, so I'll share this screen here. This one, yeah. Cool, can you see the screen, yeah? Yeah. And if yeah. people have questions, maybe they can put it in the chat or just turn on their mic and, and uh, ask you. Maybe the okay. mic is better because the chat, I uh, would have to, I have to open it and then it's overlapping with my slides. Okay. Unless there's a way, yeah, I don't know how to. Yeah, yeah obviously feel free to interrupt and say something. Yeah, so whenever you... Yeah, I think you can start, Mark, don't worry. Okay, good. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so thanks for uh, tuning in. And uh, thanks to Andreas for the organization and Philip. Too bad he's not here. Um, yeah, maybe I'll also use the, the pointer sometimes to point at stuff. Yeah, so I want to talk about um, so this work on, on gauge theories and especially what happens when you define uh, gauge theories on manifolds with uh, boundaries and corners. And uh, there's a bunch of work recently on this. I just I mean, I can give you more reference. And also some work that's going to come out um, hopefully in two or three weeks from now. Uh, oh, sorry, let me, okay, make this fit like this. Uh, okay, so my motivations for doing this is um, obviously quantum gravity because that's, uh, that's my, my initial background. And the strategy that we usually follow typically in, in quantum gravity or at least in, in loop quantum gravity to when we want to understand complicated quantum systems, a fruitful approach is to try to actually kind of break up complicated system into small subsystems, try to attach degrees of freedom to these subsystems and then understand how these small local subsystems kind of communicate and talk to each other. And this is kind of the picture which has also appeared in many many different works recently. It's kind of this idea that space or space-time can be understood as kind of a network of entangled subsystems. So space itself is arising from a relationship between a bunch of local subsystems which are entangled and communicating together. So I put a bunch of kind of just schematic pictures here. This is what we have in, in loop quantum gravity with these spin network states. There's also this tensor network normalization uh, algorithms in condensed matter. And also there's kind of similar ideas in uh, quantum information and ads CFT holography. So this kind of brings the, this kind of very general question is what is the proper notion of a, of a subsystem for a, a gravitational theory or for a gauge theory in general? And then once we understand these subsystems, what I want to understand here, so you will see the central theme of this talk is what is the good notion of symmetry, which actually tells us how to glue these subsystems together. So what are the proper symmetries which appear on boundaries of theories once we start chopping them into small subregions? So why we have to understand and be careful about boundary symmetries and boundary degrees of freedom? Well, this takes us back to you know, things which have been known for a long time, which is that whenever you define a gauge theory on a manifold with boundaries, the fact that you have a boundary actually interferes with gauge transformations and because of this, the boundary can support a new degrees of freedom. And people have also understood for a long time that these new degrees of freedom supported on boundaries, they most likely play a very important physical role. So this is illustrated in holography, ads -CFT, also in condensed matter, I will come back to this. Also, people have suggested that the entropy of black holes is actually due to degrees of freedom living on the horizon of the black hole. And also recently, there's been a, a big regain of interest in these uh, boundary degrees of freedom um, in the context of the, the work of mostly Strominger and many of his collaborators about some structure which uh, Strominger calls the infrared triangle. And so this just to 
say very briefly what this is and why this is exciting many people at the moment. So this infrared triangle is a set of uh, relationships between three phenomena which happen in the infrared regime of massless theories. And this relates to so these three uh, tips of the triangle. One of the tips is so-called soft theorems. These are theorems about factorizations of scattering amplitudes in massless theories. Another side of the triangle is so-called memory effects. So these are um, kind of infrared observables in uh, theories like gravity and also electromagnetism, which can be related to these soft theorems in uh, quantum field theory. And interestingly, the third uh, type tip of the triangle, as Strominger showed, is that it's related to uh, this notion of asymptotic symmetries. So these asymptotic symmetries are actually um, symmetry transformations, which are not actually gauge transformations, but which are true physical transformations of the system. So there are transformations which would be gauge in the bulk, but because we have a boundary on the system, these transformations are not gauge anymore. There are true physical transformations which map uh, between different states of the system. Sorry, Mark, so, yeah. sorry Mark, for the uh, maybe trivial question, but why does the presence of the boundary transforms gauge transformation into physical transformation? Ah, thanks, yeah. So I will, so the rest of the talk will be about actually explaining this, but um, if you want. Ah, okay, sorry. <laughs> no, 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 thanks, thanks. But if you want a, a preliminary reason is that whenever you define um, a theory on a manifold with boundaries, you have to put boundary conditions for the theory to be well-defined, right? But now if you do um, gauge transformations, typically gauge transformations, they don't preserve the boundary conditions which you have chosen. So this means, okay, that, I see. I this see. means that not, not all gauge transformations are allowed. You only allowed gauge transformations which preserve your boundary conditions. Otherwise, the variational principle is not well defined for your theory. So this okay, means thank you. To, to restrict the gauge transformations, but gauge transformations are precisely transformations which map, you know, which tells that different states of the system get identified. They are gauge equivalent. So now if you disallow some gauge transformation, it means that some configurations of the system don't get identified anymore and they become kind of independent uh, configurations or independent degrees of freedom. So we will see this exactly how it works. So this was a bit uh, the motivation. So now let me be a bit more precise and talk about this notion of local subsystems and gauge transformations. So for subsystems, we can imagine, for example, a spatial slice, and you imagine that you have a bounded region sigma, and then you have everything that's outside of this region, so sigma bar. And uh, now we ask a simple question. Imagine you have a theory with a Hilbert space. Can you actually decompose the Hilbert space of the, of the full theory? see on the manifold sigma union sigma bar into Hilbert spaces associated to the subregions, So sigma and sigma bar individually. And for some theories, for example, a scalar field theory or a simple spin system, there indeed the Hilbert space factorizes into just a tensor product of Hilbert spaces associated to the subregions. And for example, why this is important, this is important if you want to define um, observable quantities like the entanglement entropy, for example, because entanglement entropy requires you to factorize the Hilbert space. Then uh, you compute the reduced density matrix by tracing over one half, over one half of the this factorized Hilbert space, and then you look at this von Neumann entropy, and this is the entanglement entropy of, uh, of this this subregion. But unfortunately, this factorization of the Hilbert space does not work, is no longer true uh, if you have uh, gauge symmetries. So in any gauge theory, especially gravity, where you have diffeomorphism transformations, this is not true anymore. So let's try to understand why this is not true. But this is not true because in gauge theories, uh, on a spatial slice, the states are not kind of independent. They have to satisfy constraints. For example, the Gauss constraint in Maxwell or electromagnetism or the diffeomorphism constraint in, in gravity. 
And because of this, the presence of constraints, this factorization cannot work. This, in fact, you can understand this lack of factorization as a manifestation of the fundamental non-locality of gauge invariant observables. So if you have gauge symmetries, gauge invariant observables are typically non-local objects, like Wilson loops, for example. And instead, we can also understand that if we try to imagine, you call H sigma the, all the gauge invariant states which are supported on one of the subspaces, sigma or sigma bar, if you just naively tensor them like this, you do H sigma times H sigma bar, then you don't get the full uh, Hilbert space on, on the union sigma sigma bar, you just get a subset. So why you get a subset? Why, what are you missing if you do this naive factorization? Well, what is missing is exactly, you see on the picture, you're missing information about these gauge invariant observables, which are not supported only within one region. Because these objects are non-local, they can overlap between the boundary. And then you, you have to find a way to describe these kind of non-local observables. A question? Yeah. So if you have like a spin system, like a, like a qubit, like a lattice of qubits or something, and you define some kind of error correcting code on that system, then you can have non-local observables, but you can still break up your Hilbert space. Um, so I'm, gonna, like, I'm trying to like square my intuition about that with, with this. Is, it, is that something you've, you're able uh, to comment on? But in this case, you would not have any, uh, notion, any gauge symmetry, right? I guess, I guess if you, uh, okay, okay, so if you, right, if you just treat the, the code space as your Hilbert space, then you might have a gauge symmetry. And then, and then in this case, you wouldn't necessarily be able to break up your code space into a tensor product of Hilbert spaces. Yeah, and then I think you would have to resort to this construction. You would have to keep track exactly of you know these red points here, which is what happens when you kind of cut this this, this degree of freedom when it hits the boundary. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. I have a kind of a lattice picture on the next on the next slide. Yeah. Yeah. So this kind of we're still at the heuristic level for the moment, but it kind of tells us intuitively that we would like to maybe extend our Hilbert space to actually keep track of these red dots here, of these kind of degrees of freedom which live on the boundary of the system. So if we try to kind of give a meaning to this extension, what we could do is now give a name to the boundary, let's call it S or definiteness. And then we kind of want to glue to the Hilbert space H sigma a piece on the boundary. So for example, if I put a kind of a lattice picture here, you see that wherever the boundary kind of hits a, a link of the lattice, I want to keep track of these red dots, which are here. So in electromagnetism, for example, or in lattice gauge theory, you would keep track of extra charges, like electric charges, which live on this, live at the boundary, which is where your, your, your network, for example, the, the spin network, which you're using to discretize your lattice gauge theory is hitting the boundary of your of your region. So the point I want to, to make here and show in the a bit in the rest of this work is that once you extend this Hilbert space like this, um, you have new notions which appear. Uh, in particular, you have observables which live on the boundary and boundary symmetries. You have new sets of symmetries which are able to act now on these red dots, on these, on these boundary degrees of freedom. And these degrees of freedom, the point is that they are physical. So they have a, a non-vanishing charge. And actually this has also been kind of known for a long time because for example, in descriptions of the quantum Hall effect, one can actually show that uh, there is an understanding of the quantum Hall effect exactly as the, these edge degrees of freedom of some theory living in the bulk. I will come back to this in a, in a minute. But kind of now we have a, another problem is that once you have extended the Hilbert space, now, in a sense, this extended Hilbert space contains too many states. It contains actually unphysical states, right? And again, a straightforward way to see this, if you know a bit about Sean Simon's theory, and if not, I'll come back to this in a, in a few slides. Uh, imagine you define Sean Simon's theory on a two sphere, and then you take this two sphere and you break it up as uh, two disks, in fact. But now you kind of immediately have a, see that you have this kind of mismatch of degrees of freedom because actually the Hilbert space of Chen Simon's theory on the, on the two sphere is finite dimensional. 
whereas the Hilbert space of transcendent theory on a disk is infinite dimensional. It actually carries a representation of some infinite dimensional current algebra. So here in this decomposition, you have infinitely more states on the right hand side than on the left hand side. So if you want to make sense out of this, well, you have to kind of glue now these extended Hilbert spaces by identifying these extra states that you have on the boundary. Because you have many, many unphysical states in these extended Hilbert spaces. And if you want to achieve the factorization, you have to glue the Hilbert spaces for the subsystems by properly identifying states on the boundary. And this you can kind of denote by this, uh, see this product with a GS, so which some people have called uh, an entangling product or a fusion product of Hilbert spaces. So this is a tensor product, which has a special way of identifying the degrees of freedom coming from the left and boundary degrees of freedom coming from the right and ensuring that this factorization holds. Question? Yeah, Sorry. yeah. So the, the way you identify these boundary degrees of freedom is depending on the set of boundary symmetries you're considering? Or am I completely out of? Um, well, yeah, they work hand in hand, exactly. So these, okay. these boundary degrees of freedom, they transform under certain boundary symmetries. Uh, question? Yeah. yeah. Um, is this entangling product um, something like the tensor product is somehow like, is easy to compute as it were, right? You can know how to put things together, but this entangling product sounds like something that might be more difficult to compute yeah. because mm -hmm. you need to satisfy some global constraints in order to ensure that you build a state, which is, you know, it's a bit like a quantum marginal problem in some sense, like you're trying to put down, put together local systems. So is that, is that correct? Is that intuition correct? Yes, that's uh, totally correct, yeah. Okay. Indeed, in general, this entangling product is, is uh, if you want to really, you know, construct it, it it's, it's a complicated procedure. Yeah. Uh, we'll try to give an example of a system for which we know how to do this explicitly. And uh, I guess if you have a non-overlapping, if you have non-overlapping, purely non-overlapping subsystems, it, if you have like two of them, for instance, maybe it's not so hard because then you're looking at like something like a, oh no, even then, never mind. Yeah, yeah. no, sorry, because <laughs> you have symmetries, global symmetries and things like this. Yeah, yeah okay, yeah, you, thanks. So basically this entangling product is like looking at a singlet uh, space under the action of these of these, uh, these boundary symmetries. Yeah. So depending on how complicated this boundary symmetry group is, this entangling product can be immensely complicated. Yeah. There's only, I think, a few theories where we know uh, but kind of the point that I wanted to, to, to make here, and um, so this has appeared in, I cite many authors here, so mostly people who have studied definition of entanglement entropy in uh, engaged theories. So mostly this was done on the lattice. Now there is also some work in the continuum. Kind of the upshot, if you want, is that these, these states which live on the boundary, which appear when you break a theory into you know, small subsystems with a, with a finite boundary, these edge modes, which live on the boundary, they actually, they are physical, and there is a sense in which they actually contribute to the entanglement entropy. So that's kind of um, telling you that these states are physical and you have to, you better be able to keep track of them and to know how to describe them. So how to do this, that's kind of the goal of this talk to present maybe a way to do this. Well, in general, for a, you, give, you, you give yourself an arbitrary theory, maybe you're not lucky, you don't know the Hilbert space. So it's maybe not nice to start with the Hilbert space, but you can focus on the classical analog, which is the phase space. If you know the, the action for a theory, you know the phase space, presumably. So you can try to mimic this construction at the classical level. So at the classical level, you can ask the same question. Is there a way to kind of extend the phase space of your theory and to add something on the boundary, like a boundary phase space with boundary canonical variables such that now you can again, you know, obtain the full phase space by gluing these extended phase spaces under the action of some boundary symmetries. So you have to identify what are the boundary symmetries of the classical theory that you're considering. And so you have to find the formalism for doing this on a, on a spatial slice. And then what I want also to present is then once you understand this on a spatial slice, how do you extend this to a covariant space-time picture? So we will start by constructing things on a slice and then go to a space-time picture. So a convenient way to construct this on a slice is to use uh, something called the covariant phase space formalism. 
I briefly present this covariant phase space formalism, hopefully I manage to be a bit pedagogical. And then section four, I give a few examples of this construction. And then section five, we, we can talk a bit about the, the covariant space time realization of this. So the, what is this covariant phase space? The covariant phase space, you can think of this as, a, as a, some kind of geometrical structure on the space of solutions of a given theory. So how do you get to these structures? Well, uh, a central role in this covariant phase space is played by an object called the pre-symplectic potential. And so this uh, symplectic potential, you have actually already encountered this because it's just the boundary term which appears when you compute equations of motion from a Lagrangian. So if you take a Lagrangian L, you compute its variation, but then because you have derivatives, you have to do integrations by parts to get the equations of motion. So this gives you the equations of motion, but then you get a boundary term from this integration by parts. This boundary term is, is a theta, and this theta is called the symplectic potential. Now you see, I just use a, the terminology, it's not so important for what follows, but um, to be a bit precise, sometimes we call this object a, a D minus one comma one form. This is because this object has kind of a, a dual nature. Um, so it's a differential form from the space-time point of view. So see, if the Lagrangian is a D form, then this boundary term is a D minus one form. So that's the, the form degree from a space-time point of view. And now you see, because we also took this, this variation, this delta is a variation of the fields of the theory. So you take a variation of the Lagrangian. Here you have the equation of motion times the variation of the fields. And then in this theta, you also have a variation of the field. So because there is this, this delta here, which you can think as a kind of a differential on the space of fields, you can also think of this object as being a one form in the space of fields. So in space time, it's a D minus one form, and in the space of fields, it's a one form. So now why is this object important, this object theta? Because it essentially determines all the, um, all the structure of classical Hamiltonian mechanics. So it gives you the Noether charges of the theory. It gives you the symplectic structure. So in particular, the symplectic structure, you just take a second variation of this object theta. So, uh, a variation in the space of fields, and you integrate this over a hypersurface. This by construction is the symplectic structure of your theory. Which it tells you which variable is canonically conjugated to which variable. And also importantly, uh, once you have the symplectic structure, you can know uh, the generators of gauge transformations and also the charges of these gauge transformations. And how do you know this? You just know this by essentially contracting a gauge transformation with the symplectic structure. Um, and see, I'm, to go back to the comment I made before, I'm using this kind of double hook notation here because this is not a contraction of a, of a, of a vector and a differential form, but it's a, the contraction in the, sp in the space of fields. So it's the contraction of this variation of the fields with the symplectic structure which is now a two form in the space of fields. So see in this symplectic structure, you have, you have deltas which are, which are hanging out, which makes it a two form in the space of fields. Now I can replace one of these deltas by a gauge transformation. And if you do this by construction, you get uh, a bulk piece, which is the constraint, which is vanishing on shell, and the boundary piece, which is the charge of the gauge transformation. So this is all structures which you could also construct from you know, standard Hamiltonian analysis of your theory, but it's much more powerful to actually derive these, these objects from this covariant phase space. So using this symplectic potential. And also if you contract the symplectic structure twice with two gauge transformations, this is the same thing as computing the Poisson bracket. So you can also compute Poisson brackets and look at algebras of gauge transformations. So this is exactly how later on we will look at construct the algebra of boundary symmetries of certain theories. So now once we have this formalism, a key observation is that um, this symplectic potential theta 
is actually ambiguous. And it is ambiguous because you see theta comes from this boundary term in the variation of the Lagrangian. So you can always shift this theta by uh, D of something, which I call C for a corner. So I mentioned the title of the talk has the word corner. Corner is a, is, is a co-dimension two piece of your, of your, um, your space-time manifold, right? If you take a space-time manifold, the, the space-time boundary is co-dimension one. And then a spatial slice can also have a boundary and this is a co-dimension two object. So in four dimensions, this is a, uh, a space of dimension two. So a priori, you don't know if your theta has this ambiguity. You can always shift it by, by, a, by a corner term like this. The other observation is that actually theta is not gauge invariant. For any theory that you take, if it's gravity or Young-Mills or any, any gauge theory, this theta actually is not gauge invariant. But luckily, you can actually solve both issues at the same time. So the way to do this, I explain on the, the next part. So are there questions so far about just this slide? Yeah, when you, when you say we can solve both issues, um, one issue is that theta is not, is not gauge invariant. Is that one of the issues? Yes, one issue is that it's not gauge invariant. And the other one is that it's ambiguous. It's ambiguity. Um, yeah. So maybe I will give an example and it will hopefully become clear. Yeah. Well, I just have a question. Um, these, are, these are features of theta. In what sense are they issues? In what sense are they problems? Because it, well, maybe they aren't problems. Maybe they're just, <laughs> it's just a yeah. language. Not, you're right, you're right. You could call them features and not problems, yeah. So if you want, I want to kind of exploit these features. Right, okay. Because there is, you will see there is this particularity that these two features, they're actually completely intertwined. They are, they are connected. Because this DC is a gauge transformation or? Uh, in a sense, you can think of this DC as a gauge transformation, yes. Yeah. Okay. And, I, and why would you expect it to be a gauge invariant? Because it's giving you the symplectic structure or? Um, I mean, it is a boundary term, so I guess I would have thought, expected it. Hmm. Yeah, if, if, so if you, exactly. So the reason why it's not gauge invariant is that is precisely the reason for which um, when you look at the generator of gauge transformations, you get, you get the boundary term here. Mm -hmm. So maybe the, this example four will, will, will clarify this. So yeah, so the example I wanted to give was um, Sean Simon's theory, and uh, it's it's a bit simpler. Even if you if you maybe don't know Sean Simon's theory, but it's a bit simpler than working this out for gravity. But the setup is actually is quite um, should be quite simple because we we just take an abelian theory. So the Lagrangian is just you know some abelian connection A wedge D A. So the curvature of this connection. So that's a three dimensional theory and it's just a billion A wedge DA. Now, if you compute the equations of motion, so you take a variation of this Lagrangian, you have to integrate by parts because of this derivative, you will find that the potential is just delta A wedge A. That's just uh, the symplectic potential of Simon's theory. And now, um, if you do a gauge transformation, so I shift A by A plus D alpha of this potential, well, now the, that's the statement, the potential does not, uh, is not gauge invariant. But actually, you see it's only shifted by uh, a corner term, by a total derivative. So the transformation of theta becomes theta plus precisely d of something. So meaning, as we said, that this presence of this corner term breaks a priori gauge invariance. Now we can actually solve this by uh, kind of extending the phase space. But what this means is that now on the boundary of this theory, I want to add new fields. So let me take this new field, I call it small a. And I want this new field to transform in this way under gauge transformation. So alpha acting on a is a minus alpha. And then the only thing we need to do is actually 
you say you take this expression which was not gauge invariant, and essentially it amounts to promoting alpha. So alpha was a gauge parameter, but now you want to promote this alpha to be a field of your theory. So I just take the same expression and alpha, I call it small a now. Because now a is a, is a field of the theory, it's part of the phase space. So this, if you recognize this, it's also sometimes in, in field theory called the Stuckelberg trick or Stuckelberg mechanism. It's a way to, you take a theory which is not gauge invariant, but then you take the gauge parameter and you make it a field of the theory. And then by construction, your theory is gauge invariant. This is exactly this trick that we have done on the potential here. So now this extended potential uh, is gauge invariant in this sense. And now you see, if you think about the previous slide, if you shift... Sorry, question? Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, when you define uh, this new field, is, is that the moment where you, you gain new physical degrees of freedom because now you have like a, a new field of the theory? Or uh, yes, yes, okay. yes. So now the this kind of a price to pay for this because see, since we have shifted the potential by uh, a surface term with a total derivative, the symplectic structure itself acquires a boundary term. So now the the total symplectic structure is a bulk piece on sigma plus a boundary piece on s. So the bulk symplectic structure is not, is not changed because we don't want to, to mess with this. These are the bulk degrees of freedom of the theory. We don't change this. But now we have this boundary symplectic structure. But now what this achieves for us is that this gives you now a, a nice way to disentangle uh, two notions. One notion is the notion of gauge and the other one is the notion of symmetry. And this is just kind of terminology here, but uh, it's important terminology because uh, what we want to call gauge transformations are transformations which are uh, unphysical. So they are unphysical and in particular they have a zero, um, a zero charge. But symmetry transformations, on the other hand, they are physical transformations. They, they map between different states of the theory. And because of this, the charge of this symmetry transformation is not vanishing. And now we can exactly look at this kind of disentangling of these two notions in this example of transcendence theory. We have on the one hand, uh, gauge transformations. So now I take these infinitesimal gauge transformations of the connection and of the field A. And as expected, if you plug this in the symplectic structure, uh, you get this expression. And this expression is just a variation of uh, F which is the integral of essentially the curvature, which is zero on shell. So telling us that these gauge transformations, they have a vanishing charge. They are true gauge transformations. They are unphysical transformations. But now we have a kind of a dual notion because we have added new fields on the boundary. So now we have the ability to do a transformation which does not change the bulk fields. So this transformation, which I call capital delta, is not acting on the bulk fields, but it's rotating or acting only on the new fields which we have introduced on the boundary. And now again, we can compute the Hamiltonian generator using this covariant phase space formalism and find that this Hamiltonian generator Q is a, is a charge, is a pure boundary term. And that's the expression for this charge. Question? Yeah. Uh, maybe I'll let you finish your slide and then I'll ask my question. Uh, okay, thanks. Yeah, so now to conclude this slide, so the important point here is that uh, these observables, so first of all, these charges Q, they are observables of the theory. So namely, they commute with the constraints. This is what it means to be a, a Dirac observable. So if you compute this Poisson bracket between this Q and this F here, we find zero. But also importantly, these... Uh, boundary charges, they satisfy um, an algebra, which in this case is, uh, is what people call usually a U1 uh, current algebra. So U1 Katsmudi algebra. So you see that this commutation relation, uh, these are like U1 charges, but instead of having zero, as you expect for U1 commutator of U1 gauge transformations, you get a term which does not depend on the 
on the field of the theory. It only depends on the gauge parameters. So it's d alpha times beta. And this is a, a central extension of the algebra of, uh, of symmetries. Uh, so and, uh, yes, maybe. Um, I have to admit the mathematics is a bit over my head, uh, but I'm just trying to get a sense of like to distill. It seems to me like if I understand correctly, you're taking a gauge symmetry, you're taking what was previously a gauge symmetry, which was broken by introducing this boundary. Yes, exactly. And then you're trying, you're distilling out, um, you're sort of breaking up the gauge symmetry into the stuff that's preserved as a gauge symmetry and the stuff that suddenly becomes a physical symmetry because of the boundary. Yes, is that exactly. right? Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. Is, is there like, do you have another example where, I mean, I'm a, like from like a quantum information theorist perspective, like something like, a, like if you have a tensor network, you had in your be in the beginning of your slides, you had an image of one of these hyperbolic tensor networks that, yes, you, yes, yes. right? Is there, is there some way of, there should be a way of thinking about this from that perspective as well, right? Um, I don't want to put you on the spot. You don't have to draw a whole bunch of stuff or anything like that. No, I think it's totally correct. I mean, you, you can think of this, um, what would happen in this context if you, maybe not if I talk about a tensor network or a, but if you were doing a lattice gauge theory, for example, instead of doing the example of, of Chen Simon's theory, I could have done the example of a Maxwell theory, for example. Mm -hmm. And what, what this construction would have shown is that um, typically in Maxwell theory, uh, we know that in, in the bulk, the electric field is, is commuting with itself, right? The okay. electric field has zero Poisson bracket with itself. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you start now, imagine you want to put this theory on the lattice, so you want to discretize it and then kind of have this truncated picture where you look at subsystems, you kind of break up your lattice and you want to glue you know, pieces of the lattice together. Uh, like you would do, you know, in, in the tensor network, you would, you know, yeah. look at these subsystems and then glue them together and maybe you have some coarse graining normalization algorithm. Well, what happens, for example, in, in young mill theory is that the electric field, which was previously commuting in the bulk, the boundary becomes actually non-commutative. We find okay. kind of a similar current algebra for the electric field. You would find that the electric field itself becomes non-commutative on the boundary. Mm -hmm. So this is also a manifestation of this fact that as soon as you put a boundary, um, symmetries which um, had, or, or variables which had a certain algebra before in the bulk, they can get a completely different algebra on the boundary now. For example, they can become non-commutative. Is there like a, on the boundary, is there, do you, do you, is there an easy way of understanding what that theory looks like for those sort of en ends of electric field strings sort of thing? Yeah, so that's exactly what I want to get to uh, at the end. Maybe the oh, okay. okay. To actually try to think of the dynamics of this. Uh... Sure, so okay. At this, at this stage, we're just trying to characterize some, in a sense, some, some kinematical information about these, um, these boundary degrees of freedom. Namely, what is their, their commutation relations? What is their Poisson brackets? And what is the underlying symmetry algebra? And then once we kind of understand how to do this, we can ask how to give a dynamics to these fields and how to understand this from a space-time picture. Uh, sorry, Mark, I have a quick question. So you define a transformation that's on the boundary that doesn't affect the bulk fields, but affect only this field A, right? Like small yeah. A. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but isn't the, like, the bulk field uh, on the boundary too? Like how can, uh, how can this transformation just affect like part of it? Um, well, in fact, so the property of this transformation is not so much that it doesn't act on the bulk fields and only on the boundary. Maybe if I said this, it was a mistake, sorry. The meaning of this transformation is that it does not act on the, on A, on, on the initial fields that you had. So no oh, matter okay. whether A lives in the bulk or on the boundary, A is not acted on. Okay, okay. okay. Right. I'm not sure I I'm not sure I understood that. So, um... I guess the canonical example I, I'm familiar with would be, say, general relativity, where I consider all diffeomorphisms, forms, all diffeos, but not. The, but then I, um, if I have a boundary, then I, then I, um, only consider the diffeomorphisms which preserve the boundary. Yeah. 
Um, but here, I guess, um, or for the example you just gave um, with the electric field, um, what are the gauge transformations that um, I'm modding out by now? They're Uh, well, now the point of this disentangling is that all gauge transformations are allowed. So you can do any gauge transformation. So if we did the same thing for, for gravity, for diffeomorphisms, you could, for gauge transformations, you could do any diffeomorphism. So any diffeomorphism would be pure gauge. But then you could act, you could look at the kind of the subset of diffeomorphisms which become physical on the boundary. And then, as you said, these are actually the diffeomorphisms that preserve the surface. Yeah, so I guess I'm asking, you know, the diffeomorphisms which preserve the, the surface, those are ones I understand. Whereas in the, in the electromagnetism case, um, uh, what, what would that sentence translate to? Well, actually, yeah, it's actually, it does not translate in a sense. Because you're right, uh, and gravity has this peculiarity that, um, yeah, that not all diffeomorphisms have actually uh, kind of corresponding Hamiltonian generators and charges. But that's just, uh, that's case by case, depending on the theory, then you have to kind of study and see which, you know, which gauge transformations are, are actually realized in your theory and, and which are not. But um, in the example you gave where you're th talking about electromagnetism, um, what is the, you know, I, I, naively, I would think I have in the bulk on the boundary, I have the same set of gauge transformations that I have, mm -hmm. you know, these get the, the ordinary gauge transformations. And then what is it now that is somehow giving me these extra degrees of freedom? Somehow the, the gauge transformations are restricted, but since these are anyway local ga gauge transformations, why is it that the ones on the boundary are somehow special? Um, so, so if or you want, same with the Chern, maybe the same with the churn Simons, I suppose. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. So, if you want, I can maybe a bit ref so maybe I go on. I can maybe summarize it and try to to rephrase what what this what this has achieved. And uh, mm -hmm. in fact, so in fact, what I'm presenting here, for example, the derivation of this of this U1 current algebra, so this this infinite dimensional algebra of boundary symmetries here. This is actually known for Chun Simon theory without actually having to go through this procedure. You don't have to introduce these extra fields on the boundary. You don't have to force this disentangling between gauge transformations and boundary symmetries. Because um, this goes back to work from the, the 90s by uh, mostly by uh, Balachandran and some of his collaborators. This just has to do with the fact that if you, um, as we said in the beginning, as soon as you have a gauge theory on a manifold with boundaries, you have to be careful with what happens with boundary terms of constraints and generators of gauge transformations. And um, typically what happens is that you have to restrict the gauge transformations on the boundary. So the usual way of proceeding is that you would restrict your gauge transformations on the boundary and because you restrict them on the boundary, for example, you say that they are trivial on the boundary, they're not allowed to act on the boundary. Because of this, you would have new observables which appear on the boundary and which exactly form this current algebra. So but here, what we have achieved by introducing these extra fields, little a, is to kind of um, restore the ability to have all gauge transformations. They can still act on the boundary but we still have these boundary observables, which have been kind of introduced because we have these extra fields now. So the, the content is the same if you want. The, what we have achieved here is just um, have a way to actually access these fields which live on the boundary and which parameterize these new observables and these new symmetries. It was known for, for a long time that any gauge theory, you put it on the manifold with boundaries, then you have some degrees of freedom which appear on the boundary. There's kind of many, there's many arguments to describe the, these degrees of freedom, their symmetry algebra, what they are. But what I'm presenting here is the way to actually have access to these fields, give them a name and put them in the phase space, have a symplectic structure for these extra fields.
So, so maybe this clarifies a bit. I don't know if. Um, I guess I guess maybe my question, maybe another way of saying it would be, what is the physical reason in for these examples why you um, restrict the gauge transformation? So you know, again, gravity is one I understand where you say I want to actually have this boundary here, um, whereas in electromagnetism it's less clear to me why you would uh, fix the gauge on the boundary. I suppose. Like what's the physical re are you just doing it because i mean i can imagine doing it um no but you so i'm saying you, you don't you don't have to in maxwell that's the so that's this difference between gravity and maxwell so that's right. in, in, okay so you're just assuming that one does this is that yeah well i'm, I'm really not assuming it's really what the what the theory is uh the theory. Is us, right in, in fact maybe yeah so I think to answer properly, I would have to go back on the on the previous like a few slides before on, on this slide here. So you see on this slide that here I put a, a delta with a bar, mm -hmm. a bar delta, meaning that if if you take the symplectic structure and you plug a gauge transformation inside, you're not actually guaranteed that this is a total variation, that this is delta of something. Mm -hmm. Okay. So usually people call this uh, some integrability condition. Which is why a priori you can write this as a delta slash because you're not actually sure that it's delta of something. Okay. So only those transformations which can be written as delta of something can be represented as uh, gauge transformations in your theory. Mm -hmm. So these transformations they are called Hamiltonian, and then it just turns out that in in Maxwell and in Schon Simons all gauge transformations are Hamiltonian. When you do this construction, you always have a delta that comes out in the front. So all these transformations are integrable. But it, turns just, it just turns out that in gravity, not all diffeomorphisms are integrable. Mm -hmm. So not all diffeomorphisms have the property that you can, once you contract a diffeomorphism in the symplectic structure, you can pull out a delta and write this as a total variation. Only those diffeomorphisms which actually fix the boundary, as you said. But that's more, that's just a feature of, of gravity itself and a feature of, as opposed to a feature of Maxwell itself or John Simon's or so, so that's not a feature of this extra layer of formalism that I'm putting on top, if, if you want. Does this answer maybe? Uh... Yeah. yeah, thank you. Can I ask maybe a silly question? But sure, sure, yeah. is theta also, it seems that well, this is what this Harlow covariant phase space thing said, that it's um, also ambiguous up to a phase space exterior derivative. Does that matter anywhere in this picture? Like this, so this inflected structure doesn't change if you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Change the potential. Does, that, does that make any difference here? Uh, no, it doesn't because as you said, the symplectic structure doesn't change. So, right. Because this, so this, this field variation delta is like a differential, it's, it squares to zero. Yeah. So if you shift theta by delta of something, the symplectic structure is insensitive to this. But does and it, I think it, does it contribute to the boundary term still? Because uh, it doesn't contribute to the, to the Hamiltonian charges. Yeah. In fact, I will also get back to Harlow's formalism in a few slides. So maybe it will. Okay. Will, uh, We'll use it and mention it here. So here I just had the slide, just, uh, you know, this is just this famous picture of the, 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 the quantum Hall effect. And quantum Hall effect typically are, you can see them as described them in terms of states living on the boundary of some, of some sample, which in the bulk has this transcendence theory. And this current algebra here, this infinite dimensional current algebra is exactly the algebra of commutation relations of this, of this edge, uh, these, uh, these whole currents living on the boundary of your whole sample. So meaning that these things are observable, they are, I mean, you can even realize them in the lab and, uh, and, and manipulate them. So now I jump to the example of, of gravity, maybe, maybe quickly also, I think we're slowly running out of time, but, um, so essentially the, the, the point is that the same story goes through for gravity. If you were to 
you know, construct this covariant phase space, look carefully, study carefully the boundary term and see what the boundary symmetries are. You would get to the, you know, the same story goes through. Um, so now as, as Jonathan was pointing out, uh, for gravity, there is a particularity. You have to restrict yourself to diffeomorphisms which actually um, preserve the surface S. So they have to be tangential to this surface S. Otherwise they have no Hamiltonian generator. But if you do this, you restrict yourself to diffeomorphisms which preserve the surface. Um, then you again have this notion of boundary symmetries and the generator of these boundary symmetries is a, is a well-known object in gravity. It's called the Comar charge. And the Comar charge is just this two-dimensional integral. Um, this sigma mu nu is, is the, 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 the binormal to this surface S. And this is the covariant derivative of the vector field Xi. And um, now you can look at the algebra of these, of these comma charges, of these boundary symmetries. And if you work out a bit, you do uh, uh, some kind of uh, useful decomposition of this algebra, you will find that this algebra is actually um, like, there's, there are two pieces. One piece is diffeomorphisms of the surface, diff of S, and there's a semi-direct product with um, SL to R transformations. So, so two plus one Lorentz transformations for each point on the surface. So again, this is an infinite dimensional uh, symmetry algebra, which appears on the boundary of this gravitational system. And um, here I was just making a, a comment, maybe I, I gloss over this because we're running out of time, but uh, about this BMS algebra. If you want to know, I can tell you in the end maybe, but let me, let me skip this. So the point was just, I put bigger, the point was just to say that this symmetry algebra is actually huge. So it's infinite dimensional and it's a complicated object. And the goal now would be to understand quantization and representation theory of this, of these boundary symmetries. Um, here I was just making a, a comment about uh, first order gravity, but let me please also just maybe skip this because it's not so important for what follows and I don't want to take too much of your time. So let me skip this, uh, this piece about first order gravity. Yeah, all I wanted to say is that general relativity, we can of course formulate it in many different ways. Metric gravity is what we're you know, used to for many interesting applications, but sometimes, for example, in, in some approaches to quantum gravity, in loop quantum gravity, it's more convenient to work with the so-called uh, Cartan or Tetrad formulation. Where instead of working with the Einstein-Hilbert action, you work with this Palatini action. You have the curvature of some connection and these Tetrad components here. So this is a slightly different formulation of gravity. On shell, it's the same as Einstein-Hilbert. It's completely equivalent, but because this equivalence is only on shell, uh, there are some, some subtleties. Um, so let me just go back to this uh, uh, covariant phase space now. Um, so now we can kind of ask a question. We can, the question we can ask is how, how can we systematically get this corner term? Because what we did before in the example of, of John Simon's theory, and also what we could do for gravity um, is to actually look at gauge transformations of the potential and try to design this corner term such that the, theory, the potential is gauge invariant. But is there a way to actually systematically get this corner term from a, from a Lagrangian, from a variational principle? And this is where it connects um, with a recent paper we had and also a paper with, uh, by Harlow and Wu. Um, the idea is very simple. It's just to, to do the variational principle a, a, a bit carefully if you have a boundary. So to do this, we just imagine that we have a theory S, an action S, and the Lagrangian has two pieces. There's a piece in the bulk, so the Lagrangian M, and a piece on the boundary, so the Lagrangian for the boundary. Now, if you do the variation of, this, of these two Lagrangians, well, the first one will give you, as expected, the bulk equations of motion, and on the boundary, it will spit out uh, the potential theta, 
And now on the boundary, we have this extra piece, which is delta of L, of the boundary Lagrangian, delta LB. And now it's actually convenient to notice that um, um, this boundary Lagrangian itself may contain derivatives, actually. And if the boundary Lagrangian itself contains derivatives, well, you should also integrate it by parts to kind of remove this, uh, the derivatives which are in variations of the fields. And if you do this, you produce, uh, produce again boundary terms, which uh, suggests, suggestively I have called uh, C. And you see that in, in principle, this could look a bit silly because B is a boundary here and we have a total derivative on the boundary. So I could, we could think that this term is actually zero because we're integrating on the boundary this total derivative. But I just write it to keep in mind that this piece is, is actually here in principle. And this piece is exactly the piece which we want to use to extend the, the phase space of the theory. Sorry. Um, yeah, so what was noticed in our, in our paper and also the paper of Harlow and Wu is that um, kind of the most general boundary conditions which you can impose for the theory, if you see if you compare this boundary integral here with this boundary integral here, boundary conditions which are sufficient are just telling that what I call these boundary equations of motion here, they are vanishing. So this tells you that the symplectic structure, which you should consider for your theory, is not just the initial you know, symplectic structure coming from theta, but you also have to use this, this corner term, which appears here. And then this kind of completely naturally gives you a boundary contribution to the symplectic structure. So now, of course, the, we have not achieve, achieved much here because we didn't give an example of this boundary Lagrangian. So now the goal is to kind of for a given theory, find a boundary Lagrangian which satisfies this. So what we did so far, we give an example in Sean Simons of how to construct this extended symplectic structure, which is the usual bulk symplectic structure plus a boundary piece which contains new fields. Now we want to ask this boundary piece which contains new fields, can we get it from a Lagrangian? So now the goal is to find the Lagrangian on the boundary which gives you this corner term C, which then appears in the boundary symplectic structure here. And then we have a kind of, if we achieve this, we have a consistent picture where we know what happens for the symplectic structure on a slice and this boundary piece of the symplectic structure, we know how to get it from a covariant Lagrangian. Also, yeah, let me just skip this remark about the, the Gibbons Hawking term. And um, so now this also, before I, I continue this, this begs a question and maybe we're uh, a bit confused at this point. Um, so the, I think the question is what is actually the, 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 organizing, the organizing principle here? Because I can take different formulations of, of gravity, like the metric formulation, the tetrad formulation, and what, what, what tells me that one is you know, uh, preferred over the other? Which one should I work with? And what you can actually uh, realize is that one can actually show that there is kind of a, a universal structure, namely that any formulation of gravity that you take, by any formulation, I mean something which um, on shell is equivalent to to usual Einstein gravity. So I, I don't mean, of course, a formulation of gravity, which is modified gravity. So excluding these things, any formulation of, of, um, of gravity, which are equivalent on shell, you can show that they actually share the same bulk symplectic structure as we expect, because if these theories are equivalent on shell, it means that the bulk degrees of freedom, they are the same. So the bulk part of the symplectic structure should be the same. But if you take two different formulations, for example, the metric one and the tetrad one, they will actually differ by a boundary term. So the statement is that you take any formulation of gravity, it has a symplectic structure omega, 
which is the canonical piece of gravity, which is common and universal for all formulations of gravity, plus a specific theory dependent boundary symplectic structure. And here to be more precise, you see the, the bulk canonical piece, I just wrote it as delta P delta Q. This is the usual ADM canonical uh, bulk symplectic structure, right? telling you that in ADM formulation, the spatial metric is conjugate to this, conjugated to this momentum density. Sorry. Yeah. I have uh, a quick question. Um, are these different boundary terms that come from different formulation of GR related by a particular transformation that is known or, or uh, it's not defined? Like can, can they be related in, in some way by a transformation acting on boundary? Uh, no, I don't think they can be related, but they are, um, but they are known, right? You can just compute them. You can, okay. you can just work them out and, and, and see what they are. I didn't realize this, this equality here. I have also a question. Yes, yes. Uh, yes, um, especially in the case of, uh, of uh, gravity, uh, why uh, should we define a boundary condition? I mean, uh, usually, especially when, when you consider quantum gravity, you expect that uh, uh, you probably consider the whole space. Therefore, what is uh, the nature or, or physical reason to define such a boundary? Yes, thanks. Great question. Thank you. Yeah. So one other feature, which I did not make explicit here, because I, I didn't want to make it too confusing, but one advantage of this, of this uh, formalism, of thinking in terms of adding extra fields on the boundary, is that precisely it enables you to, to relax the boundary conditions of the theory. So it enables you to ask the question of what is the the, the biggest uh, amount of boundary symmetries that exist for your theory, regardless of fixing any boundary conditions. If you have the most completely free boundary conditions where all fields are allowed to fluctuate uh, as they want, what is the, the biggest set of boundary symmetries that you have? And then you can, once you have this general picture, you can look at, you know, then particular cases and say that if now you impose this boundary condition or that boundary condition, you pick up, you know, a sub-algebra of this algebra of boundary symmetries. So actually this formalism enables you to completely uh, kind of relax the, uh, the type of boundary conditions that you're considering. Um, I suppose that what you have in mind uh, mostly is the application for uh, ADS uh, CFT uh, correspondence. Because otherwise, in the practical, uh, I just understand why I need to put, I mean, a, a, any reason for putting, a, for instance, in a cosmological context, a, a, a boundary in my calculation. Uh, yeah, that's true. So, but it's true that, so, if I think of ADS-CFT, for example, then there is the, the boundary of space-time itself, but it's also important here to distinguish between two types of boundaries. As I said in the beginning, um, of course, in asymptotic infinity of the space-time is a type of boundary, and there you have to impose some boundary conditions, and it's known in ADS-CFT, or even there is flat space analogs of this, that you have some you know, symmetry algebras and boundary degrees of freedom on these asymptotic boundaries. But here I also have in mind kind of generalizing this picture to, to finite boundaries. And this is why if you think in terms of finite boundaries, then you have no choice. You have to be able to you know, describe the boundary symmetries for any, any finite boundary. So I take any theory and I, I chop it up in terms of finite boundaries. And then this reveals this you know, huge infinite dimensional boundary symmetries and then you can ask okay what happens if i now push the boundary at infinity do i recover the results that are known in some particular subcases but i want to get to the most general kind of organizing symmetry algebra which is the biggest one you can realize okay thanks which in the case of gravity is, is not known that's the, that's the statement <laughs> 
And to just illustrate this, so again, I'm not explaining the result, but that's just um, what, what, what comes out. So the idea is to kind of find the formulation which gives you the, the biggest amount of boundary symmetries. And what we've studied already in this paper that will come out soon, hopefully, is that you, just for gravity, for example, depending on which formulation of gravity you pick, you can actually have different realizations of different boundary symmetries. I mentioned earlier in Einstein Hilbert, these diffeomorphisms of S times this SL2R. Actually, it turns out that there are two notions of SL2R because on this boundary S, there is a normal metric and a tangential metric. And for both metric, you can have an, uh, an SL2R algebra. So there is a normal SL2R, a parallel SL2R, and there's also an SL2C. And this SL2C comes from Lorentz transformations in the tetrad formulation. So you see, it tells you that there is a rich, a very rich symmetry structure which exists on the, on the boundary, even at a finite distance of a gravitational theory. So the question is, what is this, you know, the maximal uh, boundary symmetry? So you could conjecture that it's just, uh, you know, all, all of these four uh, algebras together with some semi-direct product structure. So they can act on each other. And then the question is, you know, what are representations of this algebra? To understand quantization of this theory, you have to understand the building blocks, which are representations of these of these boundary symmetries. What do you mean there by um, GR? You have, you have GR, and you're yeah. separating that from the Einstein yeah. Hilbert. Yeah. What I meant here is that um, actually, even for Einstein Hilbert. If you work out the symplectic structure of Einstein Hilbert, you will find that you don't only get the, the canonical bulk piece, you get a boundary piece even for Einstein Hilbert. And this boundary piece is responsible for the presence of this extra SL2R. You know, I guess I just meant when you're when you're listing these three formulations of gravity, mm -hmm. um, how are you distinguishing between I mean, I guess I always took GR to be Einstein Hilbert. Uh, it's usually the one I, you know, is, when I say yeah. GR, I think Einstein Hilbert. So when you say, when you have GR just by itself there, what do you mean by that? Yes, thanks. Yeah, so indeed, what, what I mean here is that I'm thinking in terms of uh, symplectic structures. So for GR, there is no Lagrangian in a sense, because what I call GR here is just this bulk symplectic structure. Okay. And there is no Lagrangian, I think, which gives you only this bulk symplectic structure. Because if you take the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian, you get this universal bulk piece plus a boundary piece. Okay, thanks. So yeah, so what I call just GR is the universal piece, if you want, mm -hmm. just the, the bulk piece, okay. which is common and universal to all formulations. Right. Thanks. Um, okay, now I just want to, to conclude with this, um, maybe the, the, the last part, which is this notion of, of dynamics on the, on the boundary now. Um, so how this works, so now we, we have a recipe for this and we mentioned it earlier. I kind of try to argue that we can introduce these edge modes, so which encode these boundary symmetries. We can introduce them using actually a boundary Lagrangian because we have this covariant formalism of, of Harlow and Wu and also that we present in our paper. And again, if I go back to the example of Chen Simon's theory, just for uh, definiteness, um, so, so what is the statement? The statement is that the, the full Lagrangian that you should consider is not only the bulk Lagrangian, the bulk action. So this is just, just abelian Chen Simon's, a wedge the curvature. But now you have to put the Lagrangian on the boundary. And the statement is that the Lagrangian on the boundary so it depends on this extra field A and also some boundary current J. You can think of this boundary current as being, in a sense, the, the conjugate momentum to, the, to this edge mode A that we have introduced. Because here, if you remember, when we introduced A, we introduced this at the level of the symplectic structure. So this was like in a, a Hamiltonian formulation. Here we are in a Lagrangian language. So, I don't know for the moment how A and J are, are related. This will come out as an equation of the theory. 
So now if we take this bulk plus boundary theory, what we can do is, as we had on the slide before, look at variations of this action. In the bulk, as expected, we get the bulk equations of motion. And now on the boundary, we get all these terms, basically, coming from you know, just computing the variation of all of this. So you have a term in front of delta A, delta J, delta small a, and you have this corner piece here, this total derivative. And now we can do what we claimed before. We can take the initial potential theta and add to it this piece, which this corner piece, which appears on the boundary. And if we do this, we recover on shell exactly, if you look at this expression, it's exactly the the extended potential that we introduced before Fortune-Simons theory. So meaning that this initial bulk plus boundary action is a good candidate for reproducing this extended symplectic structure. Now it's also a good candidate for something else. Now that we have an action on the boundary, we can, we, we can do something new. So now everything is kind of summarized on this, on this, on this picture, if you will. So what we have achieved, if we go back to the, if you go to the bottom left side, what we're doing here is that we're thinking of a theory, a gauge theory defined on the manifold, which we chop in two halves, M union M bar. So this is the space-time manifold. And now in blue, I placed some uh, Wilson loops here, some Wilson lines in the bulk of this theory. What we kind of try to argue and convince ourselves is that if you split the theory, whether it is you know, the Hilbert space or the phase space on a slice. But of course, even if you split the whole theory, the whole space-time manifold, if you want to split it, well, you see, if you split open these Wilson loops, you have to add these endpoints here to keep track of where these Wilson loops are kind of uh, anchored on the boundary. And these are these edge modes that we have added in the theory. And now we can kind of trivially go the other way around. We can use this gluing procedure to identify these edge modes on both sides and glue back the two manifolds together and get back here. But interestingly, what we can also do now is do a bit um, something similar in spirit to um, uh, like a partial trace like you would do in entanglement entropy calculation. Once you have split the theory in two halves, and this is possible because you have included edge modes with this boundary Lagrangian, which is living on this boundary. Now you can integrate the theory over one half in the bulk. So I, I can integrate the, the bulk on the right hand side. And if you integrate the bulk on the right hand side, well, you get a, a residual boundary theory for these edge modes. So what this picture tells you is that uh, kind of the message, the, the, the take home message here is that if you take a gauge theory defined on a space time manifold, then you think of the path integral, the partition function, and you, you split the space time manifold in two halves and you integrate over one half, then the partition function does not factorize. You don't, you're not left with the partition function over this half of space time M you get this partition function times a residual contribution, which is capturing the boundary dynamics of the edge modes of the theory. So this is exactly- Can I add something here? Yes. Uh, my impression is that uh, uh, what, you are, you, what you are considering actually is two cases. Either you're in the, in the, on the boundary, it's the, the, the extension of the bulk, uh, states uh, or model or theory to the boundary is continuous without a gap or the other case that you, uh, you have just explained you have a sort of gap between uh, between what is inside the bulk and what is on the boundary now you consider it either as classical or as a state in a quantum uh, quantum model am, uh, am i true or um it, uh, it's thanks for the remark i think it's partially true because it's it's more than just continuity so here by putting these edge modes indeed uh, i didn't write a, a, an explicit example of this because i think on the next slide there is one you can look briefly but 
kind of one, one naive way of doing this, imagine you define Maxwell on the manifold with boundaries, and then you want to put, uh, you know, split the, the manifold into two halves. Um, of course, what you have to impose is that the, the gauge field is continuous across the boundary. Otherwise, you cannot match the two sides, right? So you would put, for example, a, a, a delta function, which you can enforce with the Lagrange multiplier, which is imposing that the gauge fields coming from the left and coming from the right are identified. Um, but the point is that if you do this alone, this is not a, a gauge invariant statement, because you would have on the boundary, you would have a delta function identifying the two gauge fields, but the gauge fields themselves are not gauge invariant. So what this, the way that I, I wrote it here, thinking in terms of edge modes is to have actually a, a gauge invariant realization of this. So you have a continuity condition. There, there, is no, there is no gap, there is no, you can glue the two theories together and you can do this in a, in a gauge invariant manner if you precisely keep track of these edge modes. In fact, this, this is shown on, uh, on, on the next slide, on slide, slide 17. Here I wrote this in the case of Trent Simons theory. I mean, yeah, sorry, I'm taking a bit too much time now, but we, can, we don't have to go through the calculation. It's just, I mean, the only thing I did here was to take this, we had this bulk plus boundary action for Trent Simons theory. I took two copies of them, one for the region M, one for the region M bar. I multiply the path integral and I integrate with delta function, identifying the edge modes on the left and on the right. And if you do this, at the end of the day, you recover Chan Simon's theory on the, on the glued manifolds. So that's the, the gluing of the two regions. Now what's more interesting is that you can also integrate a subregion. And if you integrate a subregion, in the case of Chan Simon's theory, you recover a, a well-known result, which is that the, the effective theory which you get on the boundary, so if I go back to the previous slide, it's, it's this red boundary theory here. So what we do is we factorize Trent Simons on one piece on M and one piece on M bar, then we integrate over one half. Once you integrate over one half, this boundary theory in red that you obtain is this um, so-called uh, chiral action. So see, it's an action for this edge mode field A, and this is actually the action for um, a chiral field, depending the chirality depending on this plus minus sign here. And then it's known that actually the uh, if you compute entanglement entropy in Chen Simon's theory, there is precisely a piece to the entanglement entropy which comes from this boundary theory, which comes from actually the zero modes of these edge modes. And this piece I wrote here the entanglement entropy of Chen Simon's theory. As usual, there is an area piece. So an area law, which is not universal because it depends on some regularization and some cutoff lambda, but there is a universal piece. And this universal piece is minus one half log of the coupling constant of Trent Simons theory. And one can show that this minus one half log K comes exactly from this uh, effective boundary theory for the edge modes which live on the boundary of Trent Simons theory. So now this is just testing the formalism on a theory which, for which we already know the answer. We already know the structure of the edge modes and the contribution to entanglement entropy in Chen Simon's theory. And here to conclude, I was just presenting briefly the same thing for Maxwell theory and arguing that for Maxwell, the same thing goes through. And for Maxwell theory, it's again the, the, the same reasoning. The, the bare bulk action in itself, you cannot factorize it. Because if you want to factorize it, you have a, basically a problem with like Wilson lines hitting the boundary. So what you can factorize is Maxwell coupled to a matter field to boundary currents J. This is like putting, if you want matter fields or like electrons on the boundary on which Wilson lines can end. This is described by this boundary action, again with a current J, on this edge mode field A. And then if you go through the same procedure, you integrate over the bulk of one subregion, you're left with an effective boundary action, which is effectively quadratic in this, in this, field, uh, in this field A. It's also actually in the case of Maxwell, a non-local action. Non-local because it's kind of expected because you have integrated the bulk of a theory which is not 
which has bulk degrees of freedom. Transimens has no bulk degrees of freedom, it's topological. So if you integrate the bulk out of transimens, in a sense, nothing uh, fishy happens because uh, right, there, is, there are no bulk degrees of freedom in a sense. But in the case of Maxwell, if you integrate out the bulk, you expect that all the information about the bulk degrees of freedom and the bulk dynamics gets imprinted in a complicated way somewhere on the boundary. And this, this complicated uh, kind of translation of the, of the dynamics is in the non-locality of this boundary action, which would then also depend. So the, the precise evaluation of this boundary action. So we give some examples in our paper and also this paper by, by, this, uh, by Blumert, Mertens, and Verschelde of how to actually evaluate this boundary action. But the statement is that this uh, effective boundary action actually reproduces um, also contributions to the entanglement entropy of, of Maxwell theory, which were obtained before also by, by, uh, by, by various authors. So this is again the statement that you have a gauge theory on a manifold with boundaries. Because you have a boundary, you have to carefully keep track of possible boundary degrees of freedom. And these boundary degrees of freedom, they have a dynamics uh, of their own. And then if you trace one half of your space time, these degrees of freedom, they are compute to, they, they contribute to the entanglement entropy that you're computing between these two subregions. And um, yeah, okay, so maybe I, I just give them some, some perspectives and some, some conclusions. So, so yeah, what I was trying to, to argue and to present was the fact that if you want to properly deal with gauge invariance in the presence of a boundary, well, we have to come to terms with the, to realize the fact that we have to keep track of new degrees of freedom which live on the boundary. Now there is a systematic way of actually adding these degrees of freedom in the phase space. And this is by kind of a consistent generalization. So also the work of Harlow and Wu of the covariant phase space formalism. And importantly, this also tells us that as far as these boundary degrees of freedom are concerned, Chen Simon's theory is not different from actually any other gauge theory. I think people thought for a long time that Chen Simon's theory was very special because it's actually the example in which these boundary degrees of freedom were first discovered in the context of Chen Simon's and therefore also three dimensional gravity and ADS-CFT. But I think the arguments that people usually give for the presence of these boundary degrees of freedom in Sean Simon's theory is, is kind of convoluted and makes it seem like it's geared and specific to Sean Simon's theory. But what I was trying to argue here is that, in fact, this is true for any gauge theory, whether it's gravity or Maxwell, as we have shown, you put it on a manifold with boundaries, the boundary has boundary degrees of freedom and these boundary degrees of freedom have a dynamics. So in particular, Maxwell theory has a, has a boundary dynamics um, of, on its own, which is a complicated dynamics and depends on you know, the space time that you're considering, but these boundary dynamics uh, exist. So now the prospect for future work is to kind of try to extract more, of course, more physical content out of these this, this considerations and this construction. And of course, one, I think the, the biggest question for me is where does this kind of this hierarchy of boundary symmetry stop? So in the context of gravity, what is the full boundary symmetry group of gravity? What is the maximal amount of, of degrees of freedom which become physical on the boundary of a gravitational system? If you impose no boundary condition and no special conditions on your boundary. And I think once you get an understanding of this full boundary symmetry group, and maybe if it's possible, construct uh, some quantum theory, the representations of this boundary symmetry group, then we can, um, well, then maybe we can go on, you know, and have a better understanding of the boundary dynamics and exactly, you know, contributions to entanglement entropy. Also, I didn't mention it, but I mean, there's many ways in which the, what I presented here, um, shares lots of similarities with, with work by other people. And in particular, there's a very um, 
a very, very deep and, and precise formalism, which is very different from the one I've presented here, but which was developed by uh, Enrique Gomez and Aldo Riello. So I invite you to, if you're interested, to look at this, uh, this paper on the archive, which also discusses the, this, this boundary degrees of freedom of, of Maxwell and Young Mills theory. Um, yeah, also what I would like to understand is, so as, I, as I mentioned, the relationship between these boundary symmetry groups. What happens if you, what we did so far was uh, at finite distance, so for quasi-local regions. But people have also um, worked out before asymptotic uh, symmetry groups. So one should kind of understand better the relationship between this quasi-local symmetry algebra and the asymptotic ones. So representations of these symmetries and um, yeah, and may, so of course pushing these boundary symmetries to understanding what happens when we push them to infinity will also relate this with all this, all this recent work of uh, on this infrared triangle of Strominger. And thanks. Now we... <laughs> um. I guess so, we're, long, but... yeah. um, so we're a bit at, um, past time, but maybe if there's time for one, one quick question. Maybe I'll ask if, if you, did you want to say anything about the BMS, the relation with the BMS group? Is that what you were getting at with the uh, yes, yes. time with Strominger's? Um... Um, yeah, so, so Strominger's construction works for its property of any massless theory. So in particular, if you look at, at gravity, then there is this relationship between these asymptotic symmetries and these soft theorems. And in this case, the, the asymptotic symmetries are um, the BMS group. And the BMS group, as you probably know, is, um, is the group of symmetries of asymptotically flat spacetimes. So flat spacetimes have finite dimensional symmetries, which is Poincaré. And if the spacetime is only asymptotically flat, then the symmetries are infinite dimensional, and it's this, um, this BMS algebra. And actually, in the, even in the context of the work of Strominger, many people have proposed extensions of BMS. So symmetry algebras which are bigger than BMS and which are supposed to describe, they are basically related to the, um, the subleading soft theorems. And uh, it's not known for the moment what is the proper kind of boundary symmetry algebra that we, that we should consider in gravity. But what is kind of enlightening here from this point of view is that if you look at the simplest one that you get in the case of metric gravity, which is this diff S times SL2R, this in itself is already much bigger than BMS. So this is kind of telling you that there is potentially a much bigger symmetry algebra. And from this one, you know, all the things which people are discovering now are just kind of sub-algebras of this, of this master symmetry algebra. And then, of course, the goal is to understand exactly which boundary conditions and which, you know, physicality condition on the, um, the type of space times that you want to look at and the type of physics reduces this huge symmetry algebra to, you know, subcases, BMS or different generalizations of BMS. Great. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, yeah, so you all have. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, yeah thanks. For that. If anyone I wants had to a video... very. Oh, sorry. Yeah, Is that? Yeah. I had a very quick question. Well, usually you calculate the. So you might calculate the entanglement entropy of a co dimension two surface. Can you do. Do you think you can use this formalism or something similar to do those calculations? Uh, yeah, that, well, that would be the, the hope, actually, yeah. So it's true that for the moment, this um, this is why the, the one of the last point was to kind of understand more properly how this can be used to, to for computations of entanglement entropy. But at least if you, com if you compare this, this uh, the construction with these extended boundary actions to computations of entanglement entropy from path integrals with replica tricks, for example, then you can match with, uh, with the results. So. Okay, thanks. And also, yeah, sorry, I didn't mention it, but in the case of Chen Simon's theory, then there it's known explicitly how to, how this is useful for entanglement entropy with co-dimension two surfaces.
but not for gravity, obviously, and not for Maxwell either. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Mark. I'll, um, so I'll, I'll send the link if anyone wants to, um, there's a few people that missed it, and if anybody wants to get the recording, I'll send the link um, and send it to you as well, Mark. Thanks, thanks, Gordon. Cool. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. Well, right. well thanks for tuning in and thanks for the questions. Yeah. Keep well, thanks, everyone. Bye. All right, be safe. Yeah, take care. Thank you. Bye. Sure. Thank Bye. you. Bye, guys. Jonathan?